right, I'd like to remind everyone that at 3.30 today there will be a reception and celebration of the completion of this event at Boylan. So please feel free to join us. And uh, my name is Chris Erdman. I am a very new member of the, of the GAB. And my department is the Department of Middle Eastern and South Asian Religious and Cultures, where I mostly study Arabic. <laughs> That's where most of my free time goes. And um, I was an English major as an undergrad. And um, I think that I've tried to combine my interest in, in literature and in uh, politics, global culture. And the program BBA has been perfect for that. And I'm really excited to be a part of the uh, Institute's uh, symposium. So today, um, we are having a, an interactive talk uh, based on some MOOC experiences. And my experience with MOOCs was very limited before I got involved in this event. So um, part of this is like my journey through signing up for an account with Coursera and uh, learning about the offerings that UVA had and learning about the offerings that other universities had as well. And um, in terms of the, the format of, of this uh, the event, I'd love for it to be participatory and uh, collaborative rather than instructional. Oh, that's um, <laughs> um, And so then, uh, hello. <laughs> I'm Angela Nemechek. I uh, I'm working with Michael in the institute now.
and um, I don't want people to feel bound by these these courses, but these are just like starting points. So um, half of the group can stand up here and uh, watch watch a movie, um, thinking as you as you watch about um, memorable moments that that might arise, um, what audience the course might be directed to. Features of the lecture, features of the format that engage you, features of the format that might uh, be a challenge or hindrance to, to engagement and to learning, um, the instructor student dynamic and how that plays out in this, in this format, and uh, whether you feel uh, inspired to take more moves in the future based on what you, um, based on what you decide. So, could everyone from um, this side of the room, the room and then the other half of the group can head back to the, the, the uh, event. Okay, great. Yes, one leader from the second half. Second group. I can do it right now, yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, there's a couple of different ways we can look at it. Um, relies is one side of it, or something rests on this keyboard. Uh, and the other is that um, it's conditional. It's Uh, okay. Other 
years, they want to see folks who are the old barrel needs that there's someone there to, to operate it, to, for him to carry everything, right. the lumber or the feed or something. It's, it's mine, yeah, yeah. You know, but it seems, yeah. it seems yeah. at, it's a toy scene of work once done. Yeah, okay, so yeah. work or work to be done the next day. Okay, keep going. What else do you think about Molly? Um, I think it's a very static image. It seems almost mm -hmm. purposely Still life. Okay, so it's a still life. Anna, what did you vote? What else did he vote? Ali? Am I the only one who feels, I guess I'm of a certain age, I see a looking back to a certain small geo-social situation. I see it. I think there's a nostalgia here. Um, I think you're looking at something that's rural, quasi-domestic, static, beautiful, refreshed by the rain. It's kind of a perfect image, right? It's a kind of clear, it's a clear, one of those clear Thank you. 
resting upon. I think that would work really well. I don't mind rhetorically that way. But when I look at this poem visually and I think about I think about ready made I think about going out into the world and finding finding the thing that makes inspires make it new. I think about that which inspires. So falling, following from, and falling from, falling there in a sense from, from the assertion that so much everything is vital to us. You have to remember these scenes. I think, in fact, this may be a, a memory from childhood as possible. We must remember those clear moments. I wish 
we had time to like, do a testing, you know, to really follow through, but a lot of the assessments do require taking several lectures in order to take That's why, I guess one of my worries is that there's going to be this short stratification according to the success of production. A lot of multiple choice. Even though the question had to pull it off. I'm not sure what that would mean. It's all about this. It's just a production. I don't know. This is a well-produced thing. It's a well-produced thing. Because the music is possible, you know, with the production man. So, there's also like um, something Kristen wants to touch, maybe a Skype, but there's also a legal logistical piece to this. So, when we think about what we have to comply with um, in our own grounds and rectum, we have to comply with FERPA and show the students' faces or even require something about their FERPA rights of you know, identity associated with that. They're reporting classroom interaction. Okay. So I'm going to go get the other group and bring them back. So feel free to hash out and share your thoughts and I'll point out that's a really nice initiative to do. I've always wondered what you get besides the talking head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it does force you to participate. Can you try? Can you?
really, they were extremely they were expensive, and it's very difficult to put all of the different options for structures of lectures into just you know, seeing one one MOOC lecture. And um, so there are there are other capabilities and other instantiations of MOOCs that are that are totally possible here. But I think it's really valuable to have that experience when as members of an educational institution where we do go to class or we teach classes, um, this might be experience, an experience that, um, uh, that other people can't get, so, and they use loops and what that, what that like. way. So I was wondering if um, there were uh, particular ideas or themes that stuck out in each of the group discussions that may have yeah, been interpreted differently, or, uh, there could have been a discussion around a certain topic that um, you know, a direction that your conversation took. So, does the group who stayed in, in this, first, would you tell us which um, MOOC you decided to watch and um, the a quick uh, mention of what it was what it was about? On the uh, the contemporary poetry one on um, the Bread Barrow, so I like Carlos Williams. It was, yeah, and you know, sort of um, an introduction to how, how do you, um, how, how do you begin to interpret something that seems so clear, <laughs> right, and just like a, a, an image, um, and sort of thinking about why the poem is different than other sort of images poems. So. Our discussion focused more around the format of the, um, of the MOOC, which was more of a discussion um, Format where they had students who were contributing to um, to the professor's point, um, and so we were thinking about that rather than just a taped or recorded lecture. So how did how did you all interpret or experience the um, roundtable style, the discussion style filming of the of the lecture? I enjoyed it personally. I thought I thought um, it wasn't at all what I was expecting. I heard you say that this is unusual. Um, From what I've seen, I've very <laughs> scratched the surface there. Yeah. I, I really liked it. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's an old format of education that translates well to where you can't participate in your mindset and sort of participatory experience. Um, one thing I thought was lacking that occurs to me now is it would be nice to have, since it's such a short poem, you could have the poem right there on the screen and he blanks out certain portions of the poem with his thumb or something. Mm -hmm. So it would have been nice to have that. Um, Knowing that's about the right over all the time, that's something. But I mean, with poetry, especially, you know, like the graphic nature of it on the page is something that creates me. And so, I mean, we were talking about how we um, watched Bruce Olsen's like one of his lectures on um, historical novel. And uh, like, there are these really long passages. Um, and, you know, you put the text up so that you can sort of follow along, but it doesn't quite have the same. I, mean, I wonder if it doesn't have the same importance as maybe putting poetry up where you can actually, you know, interpret things. discussion was, I mean, for me at least, there was a sense of waiting until the professor was going to get to his point at the end, right? Which sort of discouraged me from, I was like, I'm just going to wait and like, they're going to say, you know, and he'll get to his thing and then I will do my work, right? Branching or jumping off of that, right? Um, and so, uh, so while the, the, the format was interesting, it did, I, I think I, I touched on at least the sort of like, feeling like you wanted to jump in, but you couldn't, right? And there, it, it, the, the video is just going to go and it's going to reach its end point. So that was the one. I actually found it thing. I mean, I was just wondering if I had half an hour I wanted to learn about in just poetry, mm -hmm. would I rather listen to someone talking or a few people discussing? And I just thought that, I mean, I, I would personally prefer something like a lecture because, I mean, I didn't know where this discussion was going, at what point could we stop. Was he, you know, going to say, okay, these are the four points we're going to discuss today? You know, these are the four themes in the I mean, There wasn't. If you think at the end of it, what was my takeaway? Not so I heard the discussion. Um, yeah. I'm still under the spell of what Amanda French was saying this morning and setting up this contrast between Coursera and Wikipedia. I'm still trying to think that through and. It does strike me. I've, I've had students, undergrads, who come in and just educated themselves on Wikipedia. 
even understanding the limits of Wikipedia and their ability just to click through a network of, of knowledge balances and to come away with a thickening of content. And I, I was thinking about, you know, I, I, you know, Bruce is fantastic, but I was thinking, if I had 30 minutes, would I want to sit there patiently waiting for a payoff or just try to discover for myself this, this novelist and, and find a way of, I don't know, it's not just that it's more efficient in a way, it, creates more agency in the knower. For the poetry, I like the, the discussion stuff, whether I'm literature student, so I, that's how I, I feel like I learn better, is more by discussion and interaction versus somebody telling me. I don't like people telling me it's important to call me, but I don't, I want to be able to kind of interpret it or hear what other people have to say too, the interaction with the other students, and hearing maybe some of their views contrast with the professors, or sometimes like the, the, the leading up to it, I realized, oh, that's kind of what he was getting at, but like that realizing that's what he was getting to makes me understand it or retain the information more than just hearing somebody present the poem or what it symbolizes or reading about it, reading a, a, an article about this poem. And it so also displays like, different methods of analysis. Mm -hmm. People are trying different types of things, yeah. failing, succeeding, and so it teaches you something more than the interpretation or the opinion out of it. Given that you can't participate directly, would you? It's the closest you can get to being there and having a real class discussion, a uh, discussion group like you can pay for. So, yeah. sort of interesting. Does it sort of imitate? And we were talking early this morning about you know like setting up um, you know experiences for um, students to sort of build knowledge, right? So does it does it in some way imitate that like process that you're going through to try to acquire the knowledge, right? That somehow helps it stick. Um, or I was thinking about the classroom level, I wonder if it like is similar to just being a quiet person in class who's just sort of taking things in but not necessarily contributing something. I wonder if there's a distinction being made. So um, thinking about trying to take in all of your comments, we're also modeling <laughs> this same process right here, and having some primary sources and then each taking a different approach to trying to understand it. And so to that end, um, and if anybody's uh, attended other panels this morning, they're welcome to bring that, uh, that experience in. What do you think the, uh, this format, or the limits of this format, the possibilities of this format, what, did that, what does that bode for um, how UVA approaches them and how this, format will be taken by by the world and will be kind of processed and and constantly reproduced. Um, do you think that do you think it's a, a bright future? Do you think it's there's something irreplaceable about the university present experience? Do you think that that this is the real thing? What, I'm just curious to know because I haven't figured it out yet. I think this so I think this and technology in general when it comes to the classroom is really good at um, building structure around fairly mature subject matter. So I think about an intro level type course. It's a fairly mature course. It's got its structure. This comes before that. But this type of spontaneous interaction that this poetry course um, is trying to depict is much harder to translate across that platform. So kind of this base level knowledge transfer is something that MOOCs are probably reasonably suited to uh, supplement the residential education about, but something like this is a little bit harder to translate this platform. So it's kind of personal to me. I'm from chemistry, so I'm very sort of answer oriented. And if you're trying to lead someone to an answer and they get stuck at some point, then there's not a whole lot you can do as a MOOC. Um, I think we're doing more literature stuff here. Um, it's, you know, you can still get stuck, but you don't get stuck and you're just stopped. Um, which, like I was teaching a course in differential equations, it's like, if you get stuck, you're done. Until, you know, you get help. <laughs> <laughs> just to go off the, uh, when, we when we were talking with the group, I go a little bit about how one of the main differences is just that that you're surrounded by the web when you're thinking the books. I wonder if, like, I mean, I was like, Google can take the place of searching for help, but it's the sort of thing that, like, if you just Google the right terms, you're going to become unstuck in Or if there's something that's 
irreplaceable, what have you, professor, you know, that sort of know the, the more intuitive sense of the Google algorithm of what you're trying right. to, to ask. I mean, it depends on the topic, yeah, of course. Um, it's like, I can't hear how to this formula in Excel. Well, you know, the professor can be faster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this came up at all uh, this morning, too, but I know something that we've been discussing or thinking about in music is the possibility of using MOOCs for you know, lectures and then actually just holding the discussions, which I think is also happening in the MOOCs class, for instance. Right? So um, I don't know how that you know, solves some of these problems or not. Sort of like inverted classroom type of thing? Yeah, or well, just okay. you know, holding discussion sections or lab sections or what have you. <laughs> that has been integrated into some of the classes, and there are live webcast sessions where people are invited to to attend to be there physically present at the same time across different technology across, across different screens. But um, that has been part of the technology. One thing that I think that we're sort of that we haven't seen in probably both the examples that we looked at is that. We don't see what's being asked of the student except to sit passively in front of a TV screen and, and sort of have knowledge presented to them, right? So it seems to me that one of the most important things that we ought to be doing here is teaching skills, teaching students how to think and how to do things, right? Not just imparting knowledge. Um, so I wonder, you know, that seems like a major challenge. How do we incorporate that very fundamental aspect of education into this, this kind of widely broadcast? I agree. I mean, as a, someone who has taught the humanities, I feel that two of my main goals in the, as an instructor are for students to learn how to speak articulately about the subject and to learn to write. And unless students can do that, I don't feel that you know that learning goals have been met for humanity. So I would be interested to see how. Perhaps like the music model, this is like a supplement, right? Like now I know something about the Red Arrow, but like maybe I take another one of William Cross Williams' poems and go into a discussion section. Right? So can you apply what you've learned in, in some in some real way? Um, you know. I mean, it seems like kind of an issue of labor, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to pedagogically make this stuff that you've been talking about happen. I mean, it would take you know, if for instance, someone has twenty thousand students. I mean, what do we? And I've heard um, Al Flores interview about this, and I think he does have this like army of TAs who actually like grade writing and like sort of do what we do as TAs. I don't know if they're able to cover everyone, but it seems like right the next step is figuring out some kind of like labor model where you know mm -hmm. we can not just project someone on YouTube or whatever like in a video, but reinforce accountability. Mm -hmm. Very <laughs> how do you how do you sort of assess knowledge without just making it a multiple choice group online? You know, when you want right. to write, how do you get them to write? And then you evaluate it without drowning in 60,000 metrics. It's interesting to think about like the problem with like the testing economy in American public education. It seems like this is like becomes more and more of a model. It like reinforces that as a legitimate thing. Like, kind of <laughs> but if you think too, just about the longer history, and that in a way this research university, like all of them, comes from German models of research university, where you have the high standing master professor, her professor at the top, who has very little contact with groundling students. And that's always a temptation in the history of the university for knowledge to recede to the point of distant mastery. And so one worry is that it's just happening now in a new techno medium. It's again the recession of knowledge mastery. Yeah, it's, a, it's an army of TAs, right? We're grading the essays it's a matter of time before, of course, Sarah outsources that, you know, to great people in other countries to the grading assignment. We have to come up with an algorithm. I working on that. I wrote an article about how they're, they're, they've taught a computer to grade papers. They have something to do with, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, with, like, number of, or word size. Mm -hmm. If you use a lot of big words, you can do That brings me to another. another question I have and what we've looked at here is Anglo culture right um, we haven't looked at I, I have not seen foreign language classes on, on Coursera I mean there of course there's a sort of yeah. phenomenon and all that but um, in terms of how these might be um, received 
internationally and how different expectations about how education is supposed to work outside of the U.S. I mean, how how is that going to play out when this is, as as you're saying, based on the university, uh, the German university model with the professor at the top? I mean, I think that how global is that notion? And um, can you think of challenges that people from other This American form of knowledge and learning is the way that, that you know you should, you should experience knowledge and learning. Did you find any examples that were produced from abroad? Yes, of course. Um, some in Scandinavia, from other parts of Europe. Uh, there's one that is I found one in Arabic. I found a few, a few in French. Uh, so they are they do exist in the one that was produced. In Arabic was actually by a, I think a Canadian university. I don't know that. But um, so there is, there is content in other languages besides English, um, but predominantly it's what I'm able to find on Coursera. So. There's a lot more global input 
on how this technology is developing. I'll be quiet now. several times is in improving or uh, in getting students more uh, interactive and engaged with the material. And so how uh, are we going to make that happen? And I wonder if there are models out there that even just have like course web page, like deep course web pages of material that the students can interact with while watching these videos. Um, I don't know if that's out there. I don't to see it. Yeah, I also think it's important to think I about who the audience is. Um, is it students at the university who are already taking classes um, in the traditional format at the university? Are there students who are not really at the university who are all over the world? Are there, not, are there just people who are in the community who are taking these um, for their own personal enrichment? Would anybody who be taking these courses only be taking this type of course and never have a traditional uh, course? Because I think that kind of Thinking about the, who the audience is would affect the way we um, approach some of these issues. Are there different options that you can take on these MOOCs? Like, can you, to deal with the scale issue, the labor issue, are there instances where, you know, maybe a thousand people sign up for the intensive course where they get to interact with, maybe they pay a fee, they get to interact with the catch ons or whatever. And then there's other people who just want to improve their knowledge. I could very easily think about going through this, I, I'd love to, go through this particular course before I would sleep at night, and I don't need for that purpose to, to do the full interaction. Maybe we could think about ways to categorize the courses. Well, there's a certificate, I didn't even catch it off, there's a certificate option, so at the, you can choose to take a course on a track, I, I think it depends on the course, not the course is like this, but you can choose to uh, sign up to have a certification that you can in the course at the end of it, or you can take it without a certification. There's sort of a deadline for how deep into the course, how far along into the course you can sign up for that certificate option. I think that creates more incentive for completing the assignments and rather than dropping out in the middle or just not following through again. There's also a distinction between courses and knowledge, and we're so stuck. I, I've been noticing this in a lot of conversations I've been having. Been having with the metaphor of a course, that means 14 weeks, a whole semester, started hot, now it's getting cooler. It's a course. And, and that's good, but it's not the only way to know. And these machines, you know, I guess it goes back to this Wikipedia point, but these machines are good for other tasks in knowledge. And if we thought of problems to be solved or exchanged with colleagues around the world or other forms of communicative learning, it doesn't have to be the model of a course that yields the grade that has a TA. I think like the issue of differentiation, we need 
something because I feel like the lecture that we took, like we start off with like that audience and it felt to me like it was pitched very low, like you talk about how it felt like a PBS video. And I feel like if I watch that, I, I would almost want to like scaffold up and be like, is there like a next level where he'll do some close reading and he'll really challenge me to like think more analytically. So if you could have a course that kind of, you could just like go through at this basic level, but you could also like go up into levels of complexity in the same way that, you know, we like differentiate classrooms, differentiate like within a department, different Level. I don't know. I also think a really good point in that is um, kind of expanding on that topic of audience. The people that choose to take a course there, of course, they're not the people that are coming to our universities. Right. They're the people that want professional development or something like that, keep their brains interested in, in some sort of subject matter. So we have to make sure that we expand the notion of what higher education demographic we're talking about. And in, in this case, it might be someone that just mm -hmm. Once is interested in poetry and has you know four kids and has to feed a family and this is their only option. They can't come to a prestigious university and take a night course here or something along those lines. One thing we, we talked a little bit about this might be sort of on a tangent was um, the um, in the discussion sort of the way that the discussion felt like it was leading to a very particular you know point. Um, we were talking about like, what if things don't work out like that? Or sort of the unpredictability of it. And you know, we're talking about sort of scaffolding and, and tracks. And I wonder, is there, a, is there a way to build into this? Or you know, it, it, in our imagining of a digital, sort of a massive digital learning space, would there be places for that unpredictability? I mean, the forums maybe is one, or where, where things happen that you didn't expect to happen that are maybe great um, and super useful for learning. Um, you know, and, so we were defining learning very narrowly, uh, <laughs> learning as just acquiring knowledge and just time to your point. It's also about getting skills when you come into university, what are the skills? So you know, you get up in the morning, you show up for class, hopefully you take a shower, you know, you, you try and look awake and arrive, you listen to others, you take notes, you know, you meet deadlines. It's also about all of that, you know, you learn to respond to your classmates if you are introverted. Perhaps you, I don't know, over 14 weeks, try and muster up the courage to raise your hand and ask a question. And I was just wondering if we're losing track of all of that when we're talking about this and we're just thinking about how can information be disseminated most effectively. And it's, just, it's not about that. I think 80% of what I learned in undergrad wasn't, wasn't from knowledge. I mean, it's all in other things. And there is this space, and we're just listening to this in the bathroom or Whatever, I, mean, I don't know what it's teaching you besides, okay, I know five things about this point that I can yeah, I think we'll all be like poorer for it. That's, that's the only way we thought about having that in our I'm sorry, I was, in, I was listening and thinking out loud at the same time. Um, thinking about the skills, if I'm watching a lecture, I'm not developing the skill to, I'm not developing analytical skills. I'm also not developing just by the process of watching the lecture. Um, the ability to construct logical arguments backed by data. And those are crucial things to learn at some point in one's career. And if one is only doing those, then that's going to be problematic. If MOOCs are a supplement, then perhaps you're getting them, oops, then perhaps you're getting them elsewhere. But at some point, you have to get those. So that is that is a question: is how how can you encourage that, and how do you assess and give them feedback on whether they're acquiring? Well, this is returning to the previous panel on globalization and the people talking about how things are getting homogenized. There's almost this idea that you should never have to leave your house and everything should just come <laughs> to you. <laughs> that's where the I mean I think that's where it's really important to keep audience and classroom structure in mind. I mean, somebody was talking about ways to use this to flip a classroom. Those are ways that you could add to a brick and mortar university, where if you get people to watch this first, and then you go into a different, you know, William Carlos Williams fall into your discussion section, then that's perhaps a model for a better discussion, where you have to be clean, you have to <laughs> look people in the eye, um, you know. So I, I, I agree, I think it's really important to keep those goals in mind as well. 
and then also to keep in mind the different audiences. You know, if it is a person who only has time before they go to work, then grand, why not, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, hopefully we can use it for more enriching. Yeah, hopefully the person is going out and working with the computer all day. Well, then I'm struck that we come out, as I did eagerly, to talk about MOOCs. It's really interesting. But it's often the case that it's the novelty that has the glamour of our attention, as if we know what it is to have face-to-face -face seminar conversation with newly diverse student populations, with fields ever-changing, with students panicky about professionalization and dropping out of the economic universe, as if we understand that. And, and so it seems to me that you know, we, we do want to have this conversation, but in a way it can be blinding to the other one that seems to me at least as urgent. knowledge versus skills is it's like books are going to be a really great replacement for textbooks, um, but not so much for like courses. Can I? So I think one of the things that's pervasive that would inform us too is this general idea that in our life we have this paradigm that there's work, school, education with K-12. You retire, you have your child, you have these assumptions. But that's all blurred now. Like you check your email at home on your mobile device for your work when you're at home. And you want to learn new things, so you listen to a lecture, even if you have a job. And the lines between what what bucket was work, what bucket was play, what bucket is education. They're not buckets anymore. And so this idea of trying to fit MOOCs as being textbooks 2.0, or you know, the globalization and how we're looking at what it means to be educational learning, I think there's a more pervasive underlying trend that I think is real and that it's happening. your home, well with the mood you do have the opportunity of um, interacting or it puts you, it could put you potentially in contact, like say you had a partner in France or something. In our foreign language classrooms, sometimes professors will have a friend over in France that's teaching English, so they'll set up pen pal communication. So the possibilities for bringing to set up um, a communication uh, with somebody overseas that you're, you're working on French and um, I think that there are a lot of possibilities for that. That would be interesting, more interesting, if it, it was a, a, a French poetry class or something. I would be very interested in having a discussion group with somebody in France taking the same class because they're coming from entirely different backgrounds for then our educational system. And that, I think that has a lot of possibility. So, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I'd like to thank you all for the final panel. Um, so, does anyone have any, anything they're dying to get off their chest before we close, before we adjourn? Okay. And we can definitely continue the conversation. We can. We can never say it's a stay. So thank you again. Thank you, Justin, and thank you to everyone for coming.